front of the class. I want to learn something about the Bible. And it didn't take me but just a couple of weeks, and I realized they didn't know anything about it. And I'd been taught, Brother Lange told me, you know, he's a school teacher, and he's, I got hooked up with him. He began to so just start reading Paul's epistles. So I'd start reading. I'd, I'm reading all week long. And I'd, I'd go to him, and I'd say, well, tell me, you know, I don't understand this. Explain it. He'd explain it. I thought he's a genius because, you know, I didn't, didn't realize this because I couldn't read. But uh, I'd go to Sunday school, and about six months into it, everybody had moved up to the front of the class, and I was teaching. And in the Methodist church, you don't get to do it like that. They assign you a pastor. He, they, he comes from headquarters. They assign you a teacher. And so when we grew, moved up to the next class and, in, in, in you know, advanced, they, they sent us a teacher, and he was going to be there every week. And, but the good thing about it is the class gets to elect its teacher, a president, a secretary, and they elect the teacher. Well, it's perfunctory that you elect the adults as the teacher, but they elected me as the teacher. Now, that was viewed by the adults as that's just that rebellious bunch of dudes down there that we hadn't been able to do anything with anyway. And so they, they called me into the preacher's office. What are you doing? I'm viewed as a ringleader. I didn't, I didn't want to do it. I told the guys, don't do it. I said, well, no, we'll just meet out on the, the lawn. He said, well, we can't have the class out under the tree in the cemetery. We, don't, we got a classroom here. Anyway, it wasn't long after that I was told, that, you know, you can't go back to Sunday school. <laughs> okay. All right. So what I learned early on was you get the left boot of fellowship pretty quick. <laughs> and I've been associated with rejects ever since. Every time I ever got involved in any kind of organization outside of a local church, sooner or later, you know, I found, found that there was a door for me to go out of with a boot in my back end. Well, it was okay because, like I said, I, I, I started out that way. It didn't bother me too much because I was usually looking for something that wasn't in that room anyway. But uh, wanting to teach the Bible and wanting to preach the Bible, I want to preach so bad, teach so bad, and I still do. I'll sit with somebody just a couple of days ago, individual over a coffee table, teach the Bible, sit in front of 100 people, 1,000 people, two people, I don't care, just a chance to teach. And so wanting to do that and then wanting to do it effectively. And as you've been getting to study and so forth, and, you know, you go through the school, that's the edification process that I learned, put myself through it and have shared it with others, and, it's you know, it's done what it's done. But when I think about ministry, you know, there, there's a, there's, I, and I think about, wow, when I was 25 or 22, if I'd had someone that didn't just teach me what I know now doctrinally, but have, would have modeled and shown me about what the ministry was about. I'm in my 40s before I really figured some of that stuff out. And once you figure it out, if you're 35 or 40, you want to tell it to somebody that's younger than you so they learn it quicker. And I see some of you guys who've learned these things about right division and edification structure and so forth, young, learned some of these things about ministry things and how to have a vision and how to, how to cast out an understanding of what's going on in the culture around you so that you then can teach clearly. You know, people talk about we want to be relevant. And they mean let's dress like the, the world dresses and talk like the world talks so they'll like us. The way you're relevant is you speak truth to them. Now, you have to speak their language. You have to talk to them in ways that they can hear you and understand you. But you don't become relevant by just looking like them, thinking like them, talking like them. You, you become relevant by giving them what they don't have. And they don't have anything to fill up that emptiness. People search for validation, meaning, purpose, and love and acceptance in, all, in thousands of places that are so much smaller than the Lord Jesus Christ that they never work. What they need is Him. And so the issue is to, to put that out and to model that. And what I want you to do, and what I, my, my goal, and I understand this might be, you know, if, if you came here for a vital conference, uh, we don't bill it as that. It's a school meeting. And, but my purpose is to gather you together, those of you that come, and point you to ministry. This is what all that edification is designed to get you to. Now, the most important class in Grace School of the Bible is in the third year. Some of you are still working to get to the third year. We had a guy graduated years ago. He says, I took three, I crammed all three years into five. <laughs> he said, I think we're mostly on the five-year plan. Three years of class, two years of rewind. <laughs> There's the whole school on a terabyte disk. The whole thing. 
we cleaned the basement out last year. Some of you guys, I'm sure, would hear. We had thousands of VHS tapes downstairs. They put it, had a, this big 40-foot dumpster out there. They put them all in there, and I'm standing out there looking at it. There goes 30 years of my life. Some of those VHS tapes had Berea and Lighthouse tapes of Marathon, Florida on the labels. They went all the way back to the, to the early 80s with the leeches. <clears throat> and they're gone. And I, I have a radio studio downstairs that I make radio, and I went down and sat in my chair down there, which is the only chair left in the basement because they had to clean it all out. And I, I was a little melancholy. And one of the guys came and says, are, are you? Are you mad? <clears throat> I said, no, I'm just having a, a personal moment of sadness watching an era pass. And the era is the era of VHS tapes, not, not, not ministry. Or anything. <laughs> but, you know, it, it kind of tugged at my heart <clears throat> a little bit. And that's okay because, the, you know, the, the structure comes to pass, but the message is the issue. And I want you to get a grip on that and understand the times that we live in, understand the season where we are, and I want you to understand why that is so important. By the way, this thing here, this cycle, this is a cycle that I, these dates, this is the United States. In that book, The Fourth Turning, they carry that all the way back, seven cyclorums uh, of, the, of these cycles so in, the, in history. I didn't know enough about history to know how to do that. I knew Genesis and how to find that in the Scripture. Those guys didn't know anything about Genesis in the Scripture. They understood history. Now, how can you a guy study history and find out what's in the Bible, a guy study the Bible and find out what's in history? Because God wrote both of them. He set up the structure to work, and when you look at culture, it's going to work, and what you're going to find is what's in the Scripture, whether you know what's in the Scripture or not. Because God said it, and it's working. So when you analyze, it's just, well, I want to move on. One thing I wanted to say about this is if you go back to Genesis 8, 9, 10, and 11, you'll find in chapter 9 and 10 where he describes the development of the nations through the sons of, uh, of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And you'll find their borders, language, and cultures that are established in Genesis chapter 10. The reason he does it, one, is to, to tell you where Abraham came from and, and then who he's going to minister to. But understand, the gospel of the grace of God will purify every culture. You do not need to westernize every culture. The gospel will go into that culture no matter what it is. Purify it, put Christ in it, and show you how Christ would live in that culture. You don't have to make every culture like you. One of the things that happened in the 1800s with the, with the missionary movement that went, took the gospel around the world did a wonderful work, but they also thought that success looked like making everybody look like their culture. And that was a mistake. And that's when you get the blowback that you're getting today with the so-called multiculturalism and all that kind of stuff. Now, what, what goes on today is just a bunch of hot air and gas floating around the dust from people that don't know what they're talking about anyway and are too angry and selfish and narcissistic to listen. So, that, But that's part of the, of the unhingedness that comes, the crudeness that comes in the culture that loses its underpinning. Any culture, I said chapter 5, when God tells Israel, you're going into captivity. If you want to see it, what happens to a nation that causes them to be destroyed, you look at the nation Israel. They're God's nation. God says, you do this, this, and this, and I'm going to, and you're going, to, you, you're, I'm going to put you into captivity. You'll cease to be a nation in the earth until Christ comes back. And in Isaiah 5, he said there are five woes that he pronounces on Israel that are the reason they're going to go into captivity. And one of them is, woe to them that call good evil, evil good, darkness light, light darkness. When you can't make those fundamental, duh, kind of decisions in your culture, it's shot. It's gone. And hello. So you understand. But you need, you need to understand that what, where you are in American culture, so you're not buying into this sevenfold dominion theology that says we can go back out and take control of the, of the government and therefore Christianize the nation again. 
Because it never was Christianized to start with. Well, let's go make it spiritual again. Well, how's that working out? You know what the largest religious denomination of the newscasters on Fox News is? Roman Catholic. You know what the largest religious affiliation of people on MSNBC, the opposite side? Roman Catholic. You know what the largest denomination, religious denomination of the U.S. Congress and Senate is? Roman Catholic. You know what the largest denomination of the Supreme Court of the United States is? Only two, Roman Catholic and Jewish. And Catholics got them beat. Now, if you don't understand what I just said spiritually, well, then maybe you shouldn't worry about being in the ministry. You need to get back in the book and stay home and talk. don't talk to so many people. Just keep reading. <laughs> because perfected saints are who to do the work of the ministry. And if you do it with somebody beside perfected saints, you're going to screw up the, the ball game. I hope you heard that. I watch things like Facebook and YouTube, and I see, uh-oh. Uh and I see people, and what they do is they give everybody a voice. And there are people teaching on those places. That they, they, they can't get five people to sit at their kitchen table on a weekly basis to listen to them teach. And there's a reason for that. By manifestation of the truth, come in itself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. When you're ready to be a teacher and you start teaching, it'll commend itself to other people. You won't need, we have guys come in here and they say, you know, Brother Jordan, if you let us teach, we'll come to church. I say, well, why don't you come to church and maybe later on we'll let you teach. We have people do that with the singing. They say, we'd, we'd sing if you'd like us to come sing. I say, why don't you just come? Then we'll see if you can sing. And if you can, then we'll let you. But I want to hear you first. You know, you're sitting over here singing and everybody around you is moving away. I don't want you up here. <laughs> when I was in college, I had a buddy that, a uh, good, good friend of mine, he wanted to sing so bad. And that's how he sang. <laughs> He had begged me. He said, Richard, come and, come and, come and play for me. I'm going to go to so the church and sing. I said, oh, Bruce, I can't do that. <laughs> he had two notes, and they were both off key. <laughs> he wasn't monotone because he could sing two notes, but that's all he could sing. But he's just like you in his mind. It was, it was you know, making melody in your heart. You sing in the shower. You think you hit every note just right because it's your heart singing. And that's who you hear. Now, the rest of us, we hear the reality. <laughs> so ministry is a wonder, you know, it, it, it's important. And I just wanted to finish the first session by, by reminding you that in whatever culture, whatever season, whatever situation, the gospel purifies the season, the culture, the situation by putting Christ in it. And allowing Christ in you the hope of glory to be the issue. You don't need to look like, talk like, be like anybody else. You need to look like, talk like, and be like who you are so people can see Christ in you. Amen. Individually and collectively. Now that's what we're looking for in the ministry. And that's the issue. First Timothy 2 verse number Number four. And, and by the way, I, I, we, I read the verse a minute ago. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Seasonal thinking is a must. It's a necessity. Because you have to have a path through the season that you're in. And that's, it, that, that's critical. We live in an era right now where the old order of things in the civic order, the religious order, is, is giving way. Now, when it, when it goes away and disintegrates, as it has already, here you have to begin to devise, one, the putting away of it. What do you do up here? You plow under what was here. 
And then you begin to replace it with what you're going to plant here. And where you, where you are right now is in the midst of that. The most decisive period of time in that cycle is here because now you're getting to make decisions that are going to affect what you plant, which will determine what you cultivate, what you harvest. He said, we got free will. We can make decisions. Yeah, but you got to live with them. This is the deciding time. But this is a cold, dark period where you're putting off the old skin and trying to figure out what the new one is going to look like. So what you're going to face now and what we are facing is to craft the new form in ministry. Now, in my day, we didn't face that kind of a problem that, you, that we face now in the past. We've lived in a, in a culture that has basically been sanitized by Christian dumb. You won't remember it, most of you, but some of you as old as I am will remember the blue laws. That meant you, stores could not be open on Sunday. I remember my wife's pastor, who was my uncle, preaching vehemently against shopping on Sunday. I remember when I was in uh, pastoring in the early 70s in, in Selma, they had a, a, a law, they had a lawsuit against the city for the blue laws. And I thought, this is going to be interesting because the mayor of the city of Selma, Joe Smitherman, was just a lost hound dog. But he, was a, he, he had a lot of common sense. And I knew Joe. I'd been preaching on the street, got, a, got arrested by Lieutenant Green. He didn't like me preaching on the street. I went down to see the mayor. I said, I thought this was America. He said, hey, this is America. Sure, you're calling in. Rick sat down at my desk, and we sat down. He wrote out a permission for me to preach on the streets, and I put it in my pocket, went down there and preached. Lieutenant Green came up, and he didn't arrest me again. I said, Joe said I can do it. <laughs> He's my buddy. Call him. <laughs> he did, and I did. And I said, well, they're going to have this lawsuit. And I thought, well, I'm going to go down and see what, this, what happens because you're going to get all these mossy-backed preachers over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you're going to get this little mousy guy over here from the one who to get rid of the law. And then you're going to have Joe in the middle. And I said, I want to see what he does. I walked in there. All them preachers were there. And he looked at me. And he said, Ricky, what are you doing with that crowd? I said, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> and they threw the law out. But, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing for you and me to have Sunday set aside. It was more convenient for us to have Sunday set aside. Now, Sunday's the play day. You work five days a week, Saturday, you do all your yard work, and that kind of stuff. Sunday, you go play. So where, where, where are ball games on, on t now? If you've got children, where, where do they practice and when do they play? I've got grandkids playing ball. You know what they all play? They have the celebrations. It's all on Sunday now. You know what a great statement it is? If your grandchildren and your children say, I go to church on Sunday, I can't be there. I got a granddaughter, she's a star ball uh, a player, a pitcher for her, for, for her fast league softball team. You know what it is when she says, I can't go, I got to go to church? Coach says, well, go on Saturday night. They have mass on Saturday night. She says, no, we do it on Sunday morning, we don't do mass. Just that little bit of blowback. You know what that does? Gossip goes around all over. That's called influence. Just that little bitty kind of a thing. Like you didn't stand up and preach the gospel. And you're going to hell. You blow no hope in the Pope. You just said, I go to church on Sunday. Ripple effect. Blah, 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 blah. Or you can be mousy and say, well, I guess I don't know, pitching's more important than going. Church will be there next Sunday. I'll pitch this week. It's up to you how you raise your kids. That's your business. But I'm going to tell you, they, what they need to do is have you raise them in a way that puts a backbone in them. Let, let them see mom and dad have a backbone about what counts. Because they're going to live in a world where they're going to need it. And they're not going to know how to have it if they hadn't seen mom and dad have it. Amen. Mister, you got kids in your home. You have responsibility in your home. Quit worrying about off over yonder in somebody else's house till you're doing your stuff in your house. And what I discovered raising three kids is that I had enough to do in my house, I didn't have time to worry about your house. <laughs> Very much. <laughs> anyway. 
it's important to understand what spiritual organization is. Dot, lines, circles. You live in the moment, you're going somewhere, but you understand where you're going is a constant cycle. And you come back to the beginning again. Spiritual organization. You got Timothy. Look over at Titus chapter 1. As grace believers, we, we huff a lot about organization. Oh, I don't believe in any organization. Like I said, I don't personally, I don't belong to anything outside of a local church. I don't care if you belong to the Boy Scouts or you belong to Amazon Prime or something like that. I, I belong to that. <laughs> I'm talking about spiritual issues. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are, underline it, wanting. And ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. The difference between, he's going to list there the issues of ordaining the bishops. Now you've got that passage, you've got 1 Timothy 3, where Paul talks about it there. The difference between Titus at Crete and Timothy and Ephesus is that Titus is setting thing in order things that are wanting. They didn't have the structure properly put in place there. It's a young group. Timothy was different. Timothy is ministering. 1 Timothy is written after the close of the book of Acts and during that release period, Paul has that imprisonment, then he's released and imprisoned again. It's written during his, his release there. The church at Ephesus had been established in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 20, we'll look at the passage in that later today. In Acts chapter 20, he, he, he met with the elders. So by the time Timothy got there, it was a long, established, functioning church that had some problems in the leadership that Paul warned him about in Acts 20. And he sends Timothy to straighten out people that are already there. Titus, he's saying, go, go down and help him get organized. If the organization isn't there, things are wanting. There is a spiritual organization for the local church, a structure, a form that God puts in His Word to make the local church function more efficiently. I tell our folks all the time, why did you show up this weekend? Because this is the weekend we always have this meeting. You want to know when this meeting is? Find the last Sunday in April. It's that weekend. Next weekend is the the, 20, the Friday and Saturday is still April, Sunday's May. People said, when are we having the April meeting? I said, the last full weekend in April. They said, was that, does that mean May the 1st? I said, what don't you understand? <laughs> the last full weekend. Easy way to get it. Find the last Sunday. That's the last full weekend. Okay? That's how my brain works. <laughs> That's when we do it. Now, how do we do that? Frankly, I decided that. Why? Because I pay the bills. <laughs> we have a leadership that makes that decision. Now, you can come anytime. We're happy to have you anytime. There's somebody in this building seven days a week. You could probably get in on any Saturday. But you're not going to have this meeting every Saturday. That's called organization. Somebody had turned the lights on. We've got lights and a couple of them are out. You got all this food. You got all this. It takes organ. Somebody got to get it all done. You or that structure. See, the structure is not to tell people what to do in the sense of having dominion. It's just to say, we have some life. We want it to work. Let's get together. Somebody's got to decide where, when, how, who, that kind of thing. So that's what struck, that's what the form is. But first you've got to have the life. <clears throat> brother out in Oregon, talking to Brother John, he said, we'd like to have you moved up into an area. There's no Grace Church. He said, I, I found a church building. I'd like to buy the church building. Send me a man and let's have a church. Well, that would be great if he was doing it in San Juan Capistrano. Because there's a minister in San Juan Capistrano. But that's where he left. <laughs> Family reasons, he had to move up to the other place. You don't start a church by buying a building and say, Lord, come jump in the building. That's backwards. Now, is a building an asset? 
You're sitting in one. I preach against buildings. Israel has forsaken God and built temples, Hosea said. I tell you, the temp, the building, this building is just a building. You listen to our radio program, I'll invite people to come and say, our church building is located at 1900 Hicks Road. People say, where is that? So you know where the Arlington Park racetrack is? Right across the way. Everybody knows where that's at. I said, instead of coming up Euclid and going east, go west, young man. Go west. Here we are. We're right here. We've got a building. But the building's just a building. This place was built as a restaurant, Shea Paul, the house of Paul. The restaurant went out. Lighthouse Productions bought it. Lighthouse. They went out. Shorewood bought it. Then we made it a house of Paul to send the light of the Word of God. <laughs> we rescued the place. <laughs> but it's still just a building. The issue is the work. Somebody said, Brother Rick, we want to see your church. I said, I can't show them to you right now. They're scattered all over four counties. <laughs> Would you all have an explosion? I said, no, no, no. It's just the, the people are all over. If you want to see them, come Sunday morning. you see most of them then. Come Wednesday night and Sunday night, you'll see a few of them. But that's where we are. Now, we all understand that. We understand, but we understand how valuable it is to have a tool. My wife's waving a rabbit at me back there. I can't tell you what it's going to look like, the ministry in the future. I can tell you two things it's not going to be. I'll tell you one thing. It's not, it's not going to be like the past. You're going to have to be willing to restructure and I'm not talking about don't wear a tie and wear a shirt and look like you, you, know, you just came out off the golf course, that kind of stuff. That's stupid stuff. I'm not th that's not restructuring. That's just you being a, be, being a narcissist, trying to look like you're something you're not. I was in the Philippines back in the 90s and, uh, in Manila. On the front page of the middle newspaper, there, there is the president, there's the, the leading, the, the, the prime minister of the Philippines and his cabinet standing there all dressed up, and there's Bill Gates in blue jeans and a T-shirt in the middle of them. That's what you're trying to be. You're trying to be Bill Gates. You're trying to be somebody you're not. You're trying to say, well, hey, nothing really bothers me. You lying rascal. That's all that bothers you. You're more hooked on the way you dress than somebody that dresses in a robe is. Thought, didn't think I could get mean, did you? That's a dying truth, folks. You watch that business. Grace people do it. Oh, we're, 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 you know, we're so, nah, you rascal. You just are religious politicians, all you are. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to wear a coat and tie. I wear a coat and tie because my wife requires it. <laughs> she requires it because she knows what business casual and business attire is. I heard Donald Trump say the other day, he said one of, one of these new techie millionaires, one of these kids that made a lot of money on computer stuff, came to see him. And he said he, he came up to the Trump Tower there in, in Manhattan on a skateboard, tennis shoes and shorts and a T-shirt, and security threw him out. Guy worth about $5 billion, he gets thrown out. Why? He shows up on a skateboard and shorts to go see the president of your company. You know what that's called? That's called being arrogant. That's all that is. And see, anyway, that's all free. That didn't cost you anything. <laughs> when I'm talking about form, I'm not talking about conforming to the culture around you, good or bad, or change. I'm talking about understanding what the ministry is going to look like and how it needs to be structured. It's not going to be what it is in the past. So you can't be satisfied with just doing what's always been done. The second thing is you're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to learn how to apply some wisdom and some understanding to where you are in the culture. And as things change, how to change getting the message into it. That's why I've tried so hard to emphasize to you 
the issue of how God guides you in the ministry and in life. Because how you're going to develop the thing is critical. And if you're trying to get God's guidance in your life like a bunch of Pentecostal Israelis, it isn't going to work. Now, I've been around gracious people a long time, and I've, I, I know as many legalistic, Pentecostal, acting grace preachers as any kind. And they, they look to God to, to guide them like He guided Israel, to bless them based on their performance and so forth, and that isn't what's going to be there. You need to get the godly edifying. Get through the godly edifying. That's what the classes in the school are about. Get that information. Don't think you've got it just because you've read Romans 30 times. Get the understanding that the, that the truth gives you so you can develop the wisdom that that understanding of where you are can apply in your life. What's it going to look like? What would you expect it to look like? When will you know that You've arrived. Now, that's the question I'd ask. Well, you've got to start out to know where you're going, to, to, to what it looks like when you arrive, to know where you're going. So what's the mission? First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. Verse number 3, he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved... And come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow. So what's the will of God in the dispensation of grace? That he'd have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse number 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom, underline it, for all, to be testified in due time, Wherein I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles. There, that is a dispensational passage. It explains to you why Paul was made an apostle. Because the will of God our Savior is that all men be saved. Because Jesus Christ died as he gave himself a ransom for all men. Now if you go back in Israel's program, you go back in, in time past, God made a distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision back here. And in time past, that distinction was spiritually important. Jesus Christ, in the book of Matthew chapter 20, he says that <clears throat> he's going to give his life a ransom for what? For many. Isaiah 53 says he, gave, he died for my people. He, back here, the revelation is that he's going to die to be Israel's redeemer, so that when he's Israel's redeemer, he can come back over here and redeem Israel, uh, get rid of the Gentile, the, the wrath over here, get rid of the idolatry, redeem Israel, and then bless them in their kingdom. Now, Paul says, I made an... <clears throat> and that's what he goes away. That's what begins in the, in the book of Acts here. That's where you are in early Acts. Then there comes a point here where there's a transition between time past and the but now. And Paul says, now. We're over here now. Here now. He says, he gave himself a ransom for all men to be testified in due time. That's a truth that didn't testify until you come here. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter... Number five. Second Corinthians chapter number five. Verse number sixteen. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet know we him no more. We've known Christ back here in this ministry that focused in the flesh, circumcision in the flesh made by hands. We knew him that way. That isn't how we know him anymore. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's something going on here that God's forming now. He calls it the new creature. It's called the church, the body of Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That stuff back there is, is passed away. There's a new program in here now. Behold, all things are of God. I love that. Everything in here... God does it. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It's His performance, none of yours. It's not your flesh, not what you... It's what He does. 
who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So he reconciled us to himself. He's changed our status. That division back there is gone. And he's reconciled us. And he's given you the ministry of preaching that reconciliation. To wit, here's what it is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Right down by that verse, Romans 11, verse 15, he says that the recon if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, how much more shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Again, that's a dispensational issue there. He's not saying everybody's saved. By the way, the word saved and the word forgiveness don't even appear in that chapter. Did you know being reconciled and being forgiven are not the same thing? The first way you know that is they're spelled different. <laughs> now that's funny, but that's true. He's changed the status of the world here and given us a ministry to go out there and tell the world, tell the nations, your status before God is different than it was back here. Now he, the times of this ignorance, God has winked at, but now commands all nations to repent. Verse 20, now, to, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Our ministry, did you know, and I'll say this just kindly, there's no such thing in the Bible as a youth ministry. There's no such thing as a ministry of music. There's no such thing as a ministry of this, that, and the next thing. There's only one ministry for you. That's the ministry of reconciliation. And everything you do, whether it's working with young people, whether it's working with music, whether it's working with old people down in the rest home, whether it's out on the street corner, the issue is God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. Now, you want to do God's will in your life? Then what should you be doing? Oh, Lord, where would you have me to be at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon? Oh, God, would you have me go down to that Bible study, down that Bible, that, that meeting down there in Chicago? Or, or would you have me, would you have me, would you, Lord, is this who you want me to, to marry? God called me up. He said, Brother Rick, please pray for me. I said, okay, what about? He said, I'm trying to buy a car. You need prayer. <laughs> I'm trying to buy a car. And I found a car that I want. And it's $2,500. And I just want to, I want to be, I want God's will to be done in this. And so if I'm going to go off with the guy 2000 and if, if it's God's will, I'm praying he'd take it. I said, let me get this right. You're looking at a 10-year-old car with 230,000 miles on it. And you're going to give the guy $2,000? <laughs> And you're wondering if he's going to take it? And he's a used car salesman? <laughs> but there are people today that think that's what prayer is all about. Helps to understand God's Word. What's our ministry? It's a ministry of reconciliation. So... When I come through the transition, what am I trying to put a form around? The ministry of reconciliation. I'm trying to put some kind of form. I'm trying to produce wherever I go, whether it's America, whether it's a foreign country from America, different culture. I'm trying to produce a situation where people can get saved and then saved people can come to the knowledge of the truth. So they can go out and repeat the process. So what's success going to look like? Go with me to Ephesians 4. It's going to look like doing the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4 verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Notice the word gave is past tense. He hadn't given these today. He gave them at one point. 
Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till, there's how long he gave them. So the giving is obviously a temporary thing until something happened. And what happens is we come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and the perfect man under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. That ain't heaven, folks. God, where did you ever get the idea that God was satisfied to wait till you got to heaven Amen. to have those things happen in your life? And you could just walk along like a little crippled dump, you know, sucking your thumb between now and then. No. Last book Paul wrote, he says he gave all scripture that the man of God might be perfect right there. Perfected saint. Everything this passage talks about the, that the gifts did back then, the Word of God does now. Amen. Don't be spending your time looking for some gift that God gave you when you got saved. He gave you the gift of eternal life. Amen. That's the gift. And He gave you a book to perfect you in the gift that He gave you. But like I said, you know, running around like a bunch of charismatic Pentecostals keeps you from seeing that. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So when we're talking about the work of the ministry, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about, look back at chapter 3. Verse 8, unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery? Now, my take on that verse is a little different than what some people... Some people take, to make all men see, let's go out and preach it so everybody grasp it. And I don't think that's what that verse is talking about. When it says that all men, that, that all men might see, doesn't 1 Corinthians 2 say that lost men can't see things? I think what he's talking about there is, says, I'm preaching this message, John Church, which is just Jesus Christ, and to make all men see... I want to put that message on public display in the lives of some people in a, in a ministry. Did you follow what I said? Yeah. Believe it or not, just understand I'm saying it. There's more than just, let's reveal the mystery to people. It's talking about putting it on display. Look at, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at what, what, what Paul tells Timothy he's doing at Ephesus. 1 Timothy 3.15 For if I tarry long, how, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. There was a church of a dead God at Ephesus. Great is Diana of Ephesus. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was that temple to her. She was called the Queen of Heaven. Israel worshipped her in Jeremiah 44. talks about baking cakes and doing drink offerings and burning incense to the Queen of Heaven. Within five miles of where we are, she's got a church named after her where they do the same thing today. She's had her church in the earth all the way back to Nimrod. That vain religious system, Baal worship. He said, there's another church at Ephesus. It's the church of the living God. Amen. And he puts his life in his people, and then they gather together, and they manifest that life. So what, is the, what, what are we doing? What's the work of the ministry going to look like? We're not talking about buildings and, and organizations and structures and uh, boards. and that. We're talking about... The functioning of saints together, gathering together to, in, a, in, 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 in a group of saints that want to do the work of the ministry. That's not a glorified Bible class. It can start that way. I started two churches in Alabama. Both of them started as Bible classes in people's homes. But we didn't do it with the idea of 10 years from now being a Bible class in a home. We did it with the idea that there's, a, there's something we need to do. We need to see if we can get a local church established so we can do the work of the ministry. Had something more than just us four and no more sitting here learning things and having what the guys like to call a mystery club. I'm not real sure what that is, but people talk about that. There is a work of... 
What is the will of God? People get saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. Part of the knowledge of the truth is, hey, here's what we're doing. We are the house. We're the, we're the place God lives in town. And again, it's not a building. It's not an organization in the sense of a denomination. It's a bunch of local saints getting together to do the work of a ministry. The way you do that, Paul had a cycle. If you go back to Acts 21, uh, Acts 14, he goes into a city and he evangelizes the city, preaches the gospel in a city. Paul targeted strategic population centers. You've got to understand, I said to you last night, I moved to Chicago, it dawned on me. There's twice as many people plus in Chicagoland than were in the whole state of Alabama. When I left Alabama in 1979, I knew of 27 Grace Churches in Alabama. I'd started two of them. In fact, I'd, I'd helped start five of them. But I personally started two of them. I moved up here, and I'm thinking, holy moly, look at all these people. There are 150... Seven, I think it is, distinct communities in the Chicagoland area. I told our folks 30,000 people per square mile. With 30,000 people in the whole county I came from in Alabama, the county next to it had 11,000 people. There's great population centers down there. Now, that's the population centers there, but what, what do you do? Paul sought out strategic population centers and went there to see people get saved. Why would you do that? That's where people are. You know, I've preached to cows. I preached to trees. I used to have a hayfield. I'd walk around and just preach the fire out of, out of that hayfield. But you don't get any eternal results out of doing that. It's people you've got to preach to. Now, there's some folks say, well, I just don't like living in a city. Tough apples. Is, it, is life just about what you like? Or is it what can, you can get a vision to do? Now, I'm not telling you you can't live in the country. I think the country is wonderful. I lived 17 miles out of, out, outside of the nearest town for about three years. Call me or Bain, send me to the city. Turn the water on. I don't want rabbit hair coming out of the faucet. <laughs> I've, been, I've done that. I've I got friends that think that's the greatest thing in the world. They turned on that they don't want fluoride coming out. I'll put a filter on it and get rid of that. Easier than get rid of that rabbit hair. But you see, we're all different. We have different tastes. You can go wherever you want to go. It's, it, one's not better than the other. One just might be better for you. But where you go is where people are that you can minister to. Amen. So he targeted population centers so that he could find... 52% of the American population lives in the, in the 50 largest metropolitan communities. You know what's the matter with most of the metropolitan, the large cities in America? The church abandoned them in the 60s. Moved to the suburbs. Took the gospel witness away. Listen, folks. Where people are is where the problems are. And when you have problems, you're going to solve the problems. If the truth isn't there, you'll solve them with error. How about that for a sociologically astute observation? <laughs> you think about that. We're talking about lifetime. We're not talking about go fix this thing in two, two years. We're talking about the commitment of lifetimes. He got people saved. Then he started the edification process, bring them to the knowledge of the truth. When he did that, he organized them into local churches, established elders. Then he used them to go out as a base to repeat the process. We've been over that time and again. That's the model for the ministry. You're there in 1 Timothy 2? Look back at verse 1. Because here's, here's a verse that just, to me, just kind of blows the socks off of you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. After having given Timothy the instructions about being faithful in godly edification, chapter 1, now he's going to tell him about operating the local church. I exhort, therefore, that first of all... Now, what would you think would be the first thing Timothy is told to do? Preach the gospel. Get them organized so you can support missionaries. Do a demographic study of the community. Look at what he says. First, first thing I want you to do with these folks, Timothy... 
Supplication, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. What are supplications, prayers, intercession, giving? What, is the, what do we call that? We call that praying. Praying specifically, not just, oh, God, bless America. Well, you're talking about supplications. Here's a situation we need to supply. Here's, here's the prayers, talking to God, intercessions. There's something going on. I'm trying to intercede, giving a thing. You're talking about taking the details of life and talking to God about it. He's not talking about having all-night prayer meetings. You ever been to them? Oh, I remember, my, I, I remember one, the last one I went to. I was in Mobile College. And I, I lived at the mission, worked at the mission, but they were going to have an all-night prayer meeting at the dorm. So I went up with the preacher boys at the dorm, and we all, you know, we, we're going to pray. So about 11 o'clock, we all start praying, and we're praying. Oh, you know, we, and so, you know, if you're going to have an all-night prayer meeting, you've got to lay out on the floor, you know, and prostrate yourself before God. So we're doing that. About 3 o'clock, I woke up. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, have I been drooling? <laughs> I mean, I'm not used to letting you sleep and face, face down on the carpet, you know. So you, and I looked around and said, where are all my buddies? I thought they were going to keep me. They were all asleep, too, laying back on the couch. <laughs> I got up from there, went back to the mission, and got back in my bed, and Man, I felt like an abject failure. I mean, I couldn't pray through. I couldn't keep awake all night. You know, and I was counting on my buddies to pray loud enough to keep me awake. Me pray loud enough to keep them awake. We were all going to do it together. We talked about that. That's what we would do. And I'm thinking about 4.30, we're going to have a problem. Man, I was, I was dead before 1 o'clock. <laughs> you know what that is? That's just religion. That's not what prayer is. People say, let's get everybody praying for us. Well, which one do we pray for? I, I, I got in trouble. You know, the grace movement got, got in trouble back in O'Hare's day for kicking the religious idol of, of baptism, water baptism. And I've gotten in trouble in more recent years for kicking the religious idol of prayer. Because you can kick that around the grace movement and get in trouble too. But praying like Israel and praying like the heathen, thinking you're going to be heard for your much, much speaking and get a lot of people praying with you and all that kind of stuff, that's not what, that's not what he's talking about there. Prayer, folks, is, is a means to put your mind on the things that you're studying the Scripture and think about them throughout the whole day. Talk to God about what you're learning out of His Word. It's the, it's the mechanism to remember the things of God uh, so that they can make an impact on your life and in your experience. It's the channel in which you, 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 you use to communicate with your Father. That is, that you can explain to Him what, what you've come to understand and how it can apply in your life. It's a tool, an equipper, so that you can serve and fulfill the things that you see in Scripture. Prayer is, a, is, a, is, a, is the breath of the new nature, Bullinger called it. It's the mechanism whereby you take your, what you know out of God's Word, what's going on in your life, and you talk to your father about how to take that and put it in practice in your life and work it. And then when you get the blowback from it, then how to adjust it. It's, it's the mechanism whereby you take God's Word and see it work in your life. It is the application of spiritual life. That's why I say to you, if you live your life and you conduct your ministry without Pauline prayer, you're doing it in the lust of, in the, in, in the energy and the lust of your flesh. And I'm not talking about having a big prayer meeting and getting everybody down sitting on a chair. We used to go down to Pacific Garden Mission and boy, down there before you go into the meeting, you got to pray. And the way you pray at the Pacific Garden Mission to really pray is you get down on your knees, you know, like that, and you just you pray in the chair. And I, I don't know if you've been down there, but in the old place they had a linoleum floor. And I don't care how much they swept it. When I knelt down, there was always a grain of sand got between my knee and the floor. And that's pretty miserable. And I'd wind up sitting down in the seat, and I'm going to be the one preaching, and then, oh, the preacher done quit praying. No, I just got in a posture I could pray in. While I'm sitting there with that grain of sand chewing into my kneecap, I wasn't thinking about praying. I was just thinking about my kneecap. But that's, see, that, that, that's, that's... 
So what's ministry going to look like? It's going to look like that, what those verses talk about there. Why are they praying? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You're going to have a local church that equips people to lead a quiet life. The ability to mind your own business, work with your own hands, so that your daily life is a reflection of who? The mind of Christ. And then in all of your details of life. And for me to live, for someone to look at you and say, for them to live is Christ. They cherish Him, they value Him, they treasure Him. He's more important to them in their decisions. Why did you make that decision? Because of Him. Why didn't you do that? Because of Him. Not because I'm better than you, trying to be different than you. It's because He means more to me than anything. Well, where did you find out what He meant? In His Word. Well, where's the verse that said, don't do that or to do that? So here's the verse and here's how you think it through. And it's that thinking through process that I'm trying to get into your head. Where you learn to walk in wisdom. And now you've established a, an individual and a family. Those four institutions, volition, marriage, family, nationalism. Ephesians 5, it says, be filled with the Spirit. There's your volition. Wives, husbands, there's your marriage. Fathers, children, there's your family. Servants, masters, there's your community. See how it works out? The reason Paul does that is because we're dealing with the nations. That isn't how he says it back with Israel. Israel's got a different deal. That's how we do it because we're part, we're ministering to the nations today. And we're putting on display Christ. In me, the hope of glory. I've got a marriage, if I'm married. You don't have to be married, but most of us are. That reflects Him. A family that puts Him on displays. Individuals who embody the virtue and the godliness and a family and a community with social roles that adorn the doctrine and that support expanding. Years ago, I was in Florida. <laughs> Back in the late 80s, early 90s, Oscar Woodall and I were going to a prison to speak where Woody and a bunch of the brothers there around Orlando had done for years. And there was a young man who was a chaplain of, of the prison there who was coming to understand right division. And Oscar and Fred and some of the guys had been dealing with him. And because I was going to go with them into prison, there was a, a man from a grace church there who didn't like me, didn't like Woody either. And uh, he was mad at us because of the King James Bible. He liked the right division just like King James Bible. So he wrote the chaplain a letter, and he called me everything except, well, you get the idea. And the chaplain's name was Dan Matchy, real nice guy. And we go in and sit down, and Dan looks at me, he says, man, you got a lot of friends in the world, don't you? And I said, well, yeah. He said, you got any that aren't? I said, Yeah. God wrote me a letter back then, that era. He said, you know, Rick, just remember, God still has more enemies than you do. <laughs> I, I put that on my wall, the motto. Because sometimes you just feel that way. Listen, 97, 99.7% of the people on the planet never heard your name. You ain't that big a deal. <laughs> so if there's a half a dozen people don't like you, you know, what's the wheat, what's the wheat, to the, you know, what's the chaff to the wheat? Forget it. Move on. You'll get a better class of friends. So we're riding home after that. And, and you know, you, you guys remember Oscar. He, he had a real dry sense of humor. He said, well, Brother Rick, you know, that's a great deal there with Brother Dan. We had a great meeting there. 
He said, you know, let's invite Brother Dan to come over here and join the grace movement and come over here to this loving group of people that love to bite and devour one another. <laughs> and I went away from that thing. That's the first time I ever thought about it. I said, well, that's... If I'm going to invite somebody into a fellowship, it ought to be a place that's inviting for people to come that demonstrates the virtue, the godliness, the life of the Lord, the value that the Lord Jesus Christ is. We haven't been called to gain dominion over, the, over a nation or establish laws that are consistent with the, the moral framework that we follow. we just got one mission, folks, and that's to serve in our speech and our, in our life as witness to the gospel, right where we are, and to support the expansion of the gospel through the multiplying of local churches and other places that don't have the gospel. Now, whatever it takes to do that in whatever culture you're in, that's the mission. If you don't lose sight of the mission, you won't get caught up in all of the stuff trying to get you to lose sight of what the core mission is. Now, people give lip service to that. What I just said, nobody, you know, most people say, oh, yes, amen, and then go do something different. The key is you have to give consideration to yourself. Paul tells Timothy, chapter 4, verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. You can't just keep the doctrine straight. You've got to keep yourself online with it. Continue in them. Be steadfast, unmovable, steadfast, continue in it, unmovable. Don't let somebody take you away from it. There's plan A, attack the message. Plan B, attack the messenger. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. When I wrote the brethren in a little note about what to preach about this weekend, all the guys preaching will remember Brother Eldon Davis. Right by that verse, I have Eldon's name written. Because Eldon was steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I pray that God would make you some, some, the kind of a person in your ministry that somebody would write your name by that verse in their Bible. That doesn't happen by it happening. It happens by you being steadfast, unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not the religious system, but the work of the Lord. We're going to take about a five-minute stretch break. We're not going anywhere. you got about four minutes now. <laughs> you see if you need to get up, stretch a minute, and then we'll finish... Yeah. For your will, choice. Okay. <laughs> Getting hot in here. Like that. Let me get right here. Yeah, I could. I'm sorry. I got tracks with the Oh, okay. Okay, if you do. Oh, Flew around. Lou? Oh. We're at uh, 12.30. No, we... 
Okay, we, okay, we plan on 12 30. No, 12.30 is when we'll have it, when we we'll eat. The, in the, the thermostat set on 60, 73. So I don't know if we, something's turned off or. Maybe somebody's turned it on. It's been on since, I don't know. I just, if you just. It's not a turn of nine people walking in the town and coming over freezing today. Well, but it, I don't know. I don't know if it's adjusted or what, but it's just, it's really. Yeah. I just want to make sure it's running. I just, it, I just checked the, the, the numbers. I don't know when anybody changed it. I got a, my wife's uncle is big into Calvinism. Would that help? That's a tone. That's a long read. If he's... Oh, okay. Turn it... Turn it. Okay, your your five minutes are up.
Get your songbook. Turn to page 26, please. Page 26. 